I think what we're most excited about as we move forward into our 2024 range um, will be obviously 110 coming later, the 100 U7N coming uh, coming in this year to obviously replace the U7K with the 3D platform across everything will be exciting. But then sitting below those, we will bring in a uh, 100 E7N Pro, um, so a kind of QLED Pro 144 Hertz product, which is I think going to be a kind of a real sweet spot for that kind of 100 inch type market. And also an E7N, uh, 100 E7N, so a slightly kind of lower spec uh, kind of QLED proposition. Uh, so still, again, you know, versus the market, a uh, uh, an improvement in kind of some products that are out there. But um, I think the view for 100 inch moving forward will be yeah significant growth. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums TV Display and Calibration Podcast for the 12th of August, 2024. And joining me this week, we have Dr. Julian Scott. Hi, Jules. Hi, Phil. And join us from Hisense is Rob Andrews. Hi, Rob. Hi there, Phil. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, good to see you again. It's been um, eight months, actually, or is it seven months? It, we last spoke at CES, which seems like it was a lifetime ago. Um, it was such such a long time ago, CES. A lot, a lot of water under the bridge. And um, we are going to talk, obviously, high sense range um, for 2024 today. We're also going to talk about big screen TV. So that's what's coming up in this episode. So before we get into the competition, if you want to watch this video on YouTube, you can do that on our YouTube channel, AV Forums Podcasts. Uh, that is different from the main channel. Uh, so it's AV Forums Podcasts. Go and subscribe to the channel. You'll never miss a podcast which comes out every Monday at 7 p.m. And you can also watch our, sorry, listen to the audio only version uh, which is available on spotify uh, apple podcasts and other providers uh, so make sure you do that if you enjoy our content and podcasts if you think it's worth telling your friends or your peers or people on facebook groups that you're members of or forums that you're members of then uh, please feel free to share uh, this podcast with those people it's great to find new people bring them into the hobby or this cult as we like to say um so yeah appreciate it if you want to do that and who are we we're av forums we're one of the largest AV and hi-fi communities on the internet, and we've been around since 2000. I am the editor. I've been around since 2003, so over 20 years uh, I've dedicated to AV forums. I'm Phil Hinton, the editor. Uh, also joining us on the podcast is Jules. So Jules, just give us a brief introduction as to who you are. Um, well, I joined AV forums in 2003 because of the high quality of the editorial. Um <laughs> I uh, was an enthusiast and then became a professional video calibrator in 2011. Um, I'm THX PVA certified video and a PVA certified instructor as well. Um, and I am now, which very recently, I've joined Habitech as their cinema specialist. Excellent. Uh, Rob, welcome back to the podcast. Just uh, briefly tell everybody who you are and what you do. So yeah, hi guys. Uh, my name is Rob Andrews. Uh, I work here at Hisense and I'm the uh, head of strategy and go-to-market for us and our TV business. Um, prior to Hisense, I've worked uh, a number of the uh, significant players in the market, uh, kind of Chinese, um, Japanese and also Korean brands. So uh, I think been in the industry around about 20 odd years now. Not that you tell. Yeah. <laughs> particularly on my LinkedIn profile <laughs> well welcome along to the podcast it's always great to see you um, if you are a regular to our videos and you follow our CES coverage you'll know who Rob is uh, he's been on uh, quite a few videos now from CES we always see you at the beginning of the year um, it's been become a, a tradition really for the last almost 20 years where uh, a lot of companies give out the roadmap tell us what's going to happen for the year ahead and you did that uh, so we've actually seen two of the models now. We've had them in for review. But for everybody out there, maybe you could take us through uh, the TV range for 2024 from a UK perspective, um, because obviously you're UK based. Um, but obviously, a, a lot of these models now are worldwide. Um, and the only difference is the tuners and uh, some of the smart platforms. But basically, uh, a lot of the model numbers, it, it never used to be that way, did it? It used to have a U7 that was different in the UK to the US to other territories they, they all tend to be around about the same now don't they yeah so i mean uh certainly that's that is uh one of the biggest issues that certainly when i joined the company as you say uh, i think if we go back i think two three years uh we had uh our naming architecture across the us uh particularly us australia and, and uk 
was identical, but unfortunately product portfolio was and specification was quite different. So I think, you know, one of the big pushes that we've had as we kind of grown as a brand is about how we look at our, our proposition on a kind of a more global level. So certainly very pleasing from our perspective over the past two years, we've seen a, a, a certainly a uniformity come to our uh, product proposition from a technical perspective. So a UX, a U8, a U7 that you see in the UK will be a uh, same specification as you now see in the US. So it's a global platform. That said, uh, there are some nuances. So obviously within the UK and Europe uh, and also Australasia, we operate on a VEDA operating system. Um, the US, however, choose, given the dynamics of that market, they have a Google proposition. But fundamentally, the TV, the guts of the TV and the TV technology is consistent across all those territories, which is is really important for us as we move forwards. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point to stress, though, is the smart TV system, the Vida system, especially for people in the UK, because... If you get a Google TV in the UK, nine times out of ten, you're not getting the UK catch up, you're not getting BBC iPlayer, you're not getting that on that platform. So Vida is high senses proprietary system. So maybe explain that a little bit and, and obviously the services that you get on there that are different. Yeah. So as you say, Vida is um is a high sense entity um and has been around for many years. Uh, it's the fastest growing uh, smart platform globally. Um, which is kind of relatively consistent with obviously the uh, the relative performance of high sense throughout that period, but certainly what it gives us it gives us incredibly secure, incredibly fast um, platform which is continually growing. Is although uh, it's high sense uh, kind of IP and owned, we do uh, support the Vida platform across a number of other brands. So you see really kind of Vida moving out into the market as as our other kind of. Um, tires and an OS type operating systems kind of move, moving uh, into kind of a wider brand audience. Certainly for us in the UK, it gives us that kind of flexibility um, and kind of hopefully speed to market. So our proposition around um, our kind of catch up services and apps, and as well as support for all of the kind of the key global uh, streaming services is particularly strong. Uh, and certainly it also uh, proved to be a huge advantage for us as we uh, engage this year with the launch of our 2024 range with all 4K models supporting freely, obviously a huge amount of development work with our partners at uh, Everyone TV as well as the Vida team really working incredibly hard to deliver that uh, and give us the the really kind of honoured position of being kind of first to market and the kind of launch partner for uh, Freely uh, as a brand in FY24 is, is particularly uh, something that we're very proud of, certainly. Yeah, and, and maybe you can explain to to listeners who maybe haven't heard of Freely what that service is, because to be honest with you, at CES you mentioned it to me and I just gave you a blank expression because I hadn't heard of it. I, I had no idea. I'd missed that, that message. So yep. maybe you could give us the message in here. What is Freely? Why is it important? Yeah, so for, for me, I mean, Freely is, is I think, uh, unashamedly, the, the future of UK terrestrial TV. Um, so what Freely provides is an incredibly clever and sophisticated solution. So I my, my kind of my sales pitch to you, and I think, Phil, is probably what, what, what we said at the time is for me, Freely really gives you the ability to have wireless TV. It's wireless TV for the masses. Fine, you still need a power cord, but it, it enables you through... Um, IP platform to stream live terrestrial broadcast TV. So BBC One, BBC Two, ITV Channel Four. You no longer need a, a TV, uh, sorry, a TV aerial to view that content, which gives you a huge amount of flexibility and freedom. You're no longer a slave to where the aerial point is in the room. You're no longer a slave to uh, kind of choosing how you uh, can access that sort of content. The other thing that Freely also suppl supplies through its kind of incredible UX is the ability to switch between linear catch up and stream services all through the one platform. Uh, and it's a really, really seamless, uh, seamless UX that is uh, certainly being received very well. And that, yeah, that's and exclusive. That... Sorry, sorry, Phil, cutting yeah. across you there. That's exclusive to Hisense for a while. So, so it was, there are other brands in the market uh, now that have a freely proposition and obviously, uh, you know, and everyone TV are announcing kind of um, further brands coming through. That said, I, you know, my position sitting here, I would certainly say this, but we are still the the kind of the major player within the freely market uh, as of as of now for sure, and I think that will be the case for the rest of the year. 
It, it, it is a good proposition, um, and I've tested it out when I've had the, the two TVs here for, for review, and um, and certainly um, my concern was going to be quality, um, because you, you just have to look at over the air, a lot of these uh, uh, channels, the quality is not great, because you have to have the SD channels before you find the, S the HD channels further up the line. That's not the case with Freely, because um, it's tied to the TV, um, you know, you get the HD channels. If the HD channels are available, those are served before SD channels. So, from yeah. a quality point of view, you're getting that straight away. You're not, so you're not getting the case where the partner accidentally or doesn't know puts a TV on and is watching uh -huh. BBC SD when there's an HD signal. You're actually getting the HD served to you through the TV. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think it's that kind of real kind of uh, simplicity of of the UX. And obviously the complexity that sits behind it that gives it that kind of really seamless seamless approach and ultimately gives, as you say, consumers the best experience with, frankly, the minimum amount of effort. Yeah. And of course, that'll come down to internet speeds and, and how content is served and so on. But I think we are, um, Jules, at a, at a point now where um, internet, certainly across the UK, is at a, at a point now where IPTV services tend to work um, unless yeah. you're on a very, very poor set service. Yeah, well, um, I know in my parents' house, um, they've got my old LG um, B, B8, I think it is. Um, they have a problem with their router being in the other part of the house. So, you know, sometimes the iPlayer doesn't work properly. They can't get the HDR through that or whatever. But, um, and I think freely requires 10 megabits per second. Yeah. Um, so that's your minimum. Most of us, you know, the vast majority of people have got at least that or more nowadays so it shouldn't be in, uh, an issue i don't think and and mm -hmm. you know hdr through iplayer can look and, and other places can look fantastic yeah and it's certainly a, a trend we're seeing uh, rob I, i'm not deliberately asking you to talk about other brands here but we're we are seeing these smart tv platforms where if it's a manufacturer's proprietary system and you're dealing with you know uh, the the providers of the app applications you usually find it stuff that you want is there whereas um, the likes of Google TV, certainly there are things that, that are missing on, on those platforms. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, that's why I kind of go back to the, the very first point. I think obviously having that kind of incredibly close tie with with Vida gives us that kind of flexibility and, and, and insight. And those guys are very supportive of us and an understanding of the requirements that we have for the UK market, but equally obviously on a global basis as well. So I think mm. having that kind of direct link into into our uh, kind of smart provider is is a, a real asset and something that we will certainly look to continue to try and maximise the benefit in the future. Okay, let's talk flagships now. We'll come to the UAN in a second because other than the UX, it is the flagship for the UK, but let's talk UX. <laughs> uh, let's talk big screen sizes. I'm uh, really impressed at CES uh, with, these, with these models. I uh, spent a bit of time watching. I mean, it was demo material. It's a show floor. It, it, it gives you a taste of the product. Um, but I think just the screen size itself, 110 inches, That's we're getting into replacing your projector at that level, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, to be fair, I think the year before when we launched our hundred inch, it was uh, when you first see the product. It's kind of it looks like it's all the TV you could ever need, but obviously the way the market is and the way that we are, bigger is always better. So to certainly go to CES, as you say, back in January and see the one ten in in real life is is quite uh, quite something. I think also it's not for me. It's not just about the scale of the product because. Obviously, as the products get bigger and bigger, it's you know for us it's vitally important, and particularly for flagship, that the that the quality is remained and the quality, in fact, is enhanced. So the UX for us certainly um, will be coming in early Q4 to the UK, um, which is really exciting news. Uh, so we will bring the 110 to the market. Um, you know the key stats on it in terms of peak brightness around 10,000 nits, 40 odd thousand plus dimming zones. Obviously, 144 hertz QLED. You know the the specification on 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 the unit is incredible from a uh, not only an image but also an audio perspective, with obviously an inbuilt four point one point two uh, Cine Stage X surround system within it. So it's uh, it's a product that we're very excited about, and and the expectation is for us certainly that this is uh, the product that can provide that kind of 
paradigm shift in our in our brand pres uh, kind of perception and presence and and open up a lot of uh, new conversations i think about the high sense brand in that kind of mid and certainly within this instance premium space and and that's a point i wanted to make um you are now basically in the premium space um and and you'll forgive me for saying but it's a brand high sense that has always been seen as a value proposition um what is the price point that you're talking about with UX and, and how do you get that messaging over to the end user that, that this is a flagship product and this will compete against the other well-established brands out there that are known for the, the higher end product? So, so in terms of pricing, I'm afraid uh, it's not quite being released yet. We're still under a kind of official embargo on that, but it will certainly be I think it will still represent good value for for for, for the scale and and quality of the product that will be you'll be seeing. I think the um, the point around obviously uh, kind of the premiumization of the brand. I think if if you know if we go back in time and look at the uh, kind of the evolution of some of our other real incumbent and strong premium brands, there has always been a, a kind of a similar path followed, frankly, across all, all of those all of those brands. And obviously, we're on, we're on that same journey as well. Our, our hope is that you know what what gives people the the confidence to buy into the high sense brand at this perspective, really is is around the specification and performance. This is this is a TV built purely for. Um, purely for show frankly it is uh kind of the pinnacle of the, the the kind of technical envelope that we are currently pushing and i think certainly coming out of ces with the number of awards and kind of best in show um reviews that that product received we're very confident that from a technical perspective this is is something quite special for us and are you treating this as a halo product is is it something that you know, you're you're not going to shift volume with with this product, are you? It's more it's more about showing what the brand's capable of. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, we we obviously have commercial targets for this, and, and we're bringing it in with a view that we will bring in, will bring quantity to sell, and and we believe that certainly with the explosion that we're seeing in that super large market, this is very much a kind of a, a big opportunity for us. Also, you know, within that kind of space in terms of the CI market, there are other things. In the background that we are working on that will then i think open up this uh product and this kind of overall proposition that um can tick a lot of a lot of boxes so we will bring it in uh, uh certainly as you referenced in terms of having that kind of halo experience because this as we say this is the pinnacle of of what high sense r d and, and as an organization we're about but um yeah we still expect to sell uh a reasonable number of units of this product for sure Jules, any questions on the on the UX from from your point of view? It sounds. I mean, we can guess at the kind of price that it's going to be at, which would be, I guess, competitive for a sort of a, a top end home cinema projector with screen. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be a difficult choice for for people if whether they want that projection experience or they want the television experience. It is a different experience. Um, I've always historically preferred projection for for movies. Um, but um, I can see that it would be very, very appealing. You know, the kind of specifications you're talking about, you know, the number of dimming zones there, if you can suppress black uh, effectively and keep it all down and keep the blooming, et cetera, in, in, in control, it could be a very, very compelling experience. So um, even at the prices you're talking as a Halo product, it's still competitive with projection options. Um, so... Uh, it could be very interesting to see when it comes. Rob, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to ask, you know, the elephant in the room here is laser TV. Mm -hmm. So you're now looking at these large screen, the direct view, mini LED TVs, but you are also very well known for your laser TV approach, which is ultra shot through projection. So how do you offer both of these approaches without one cannibalizing the other? Um, so, so I think in terms of, from a pure price point, in terms of our kind of obviously laser cinema price point versus UX, again, there will be obviously a significant delta there. So we're probably talking about two kind of different consumer demographics in that sense. But I think, um, our position on this would probably be a little bit, you know, we, we want to really be kind of agnostic in terms of technology. So yes, we do have a, a very strong laser, uh, ultra short throw business equally we're moving now uh, with products like the c1 c2 into that kind of uh, more conventional longer throw but 
we want to be in a position where we are a brand that are a very broad church and we can offer consumers whatever it is they want. So if they are looking for that cinema type experience, but perhaps equally within an everyday environment, a bright room where they're looking to kind of watch traditional content as well as, as well as kind of movie nights, then potentially the brightness capabilities that the UX and, you know, the performance that will have is perhaps a more kind of nuanced product for those guys. But equally, you know, we still uh, have a lot of uh, a lot of focus on our laser proposition uh, and certainly see that as a category continue. I mean, we've had incredible growth this year and certainly the expectation is that in certainly the pipeline for the coming years is that we will look to maintain and continue our focus in, into that space. Equally, within obviously some of our projection, we're going, you know, 110 inches, obviously big on TV, but in terms of projection, particularly small with, you know, models like C2 looking at a kind of a 300 inch throw, there are obviously a lot more options available um, through that platform. Yeah. So let's talk TV. Um, so let's move a little bit further down the line. And, and I've seen um, the U7 and the U8. I've had both of those in for review. And the re reviews are up on EV forums if anybody is interested in looking at this. But we'll talk about U8 first of all. So if we put UX to one side, it's a great TV. It's a Halo product. But actually, U8 is where it's at for you guys this year, isn't it, in terms of um, the the top mini LED TV. So maybe tell us a little bit about that and, and inform the, the listener a little bit about that product. Yeah, so so as you say, the U8 and it will be our kind of our flagship volume volume um, uh, product for this year. So obviously, uh, it's a Mini LED Pro platform, so it's our premium Mini LED technology. Um, also carries our High View Engine Pro, which is our most advanced AI powered processor, really kind of delivering uh, some great performance in the background. Quantum Dot, um, as you'd expect, pretty much with all of our uh, kind of 4K plus uh, QLED type models. We have within the product, the U8 this year, we've seen a significant step forward on prior year in terms of performance. So a virtual doubling in brightness. So now up to HDR 3000. So a real kind of strong performer there. The aesthetic for this year, personally, I know aesthetics are, you know, are very subjective, but uh, my feeling on the aesthetic is it's a much, much stronger execution. We've kind of moved away from the more obvious uh, kind of fabric soundbar to a, a much more delicate and, um, integrated uh, speaker configuration but still providing that 2.1.2 real strong audio with obviously built-in subwoofer so you know really strong audio performer um which we think is is really important and then certainly you know kind of more more than aware that uh and you know av forums uh viewers of this will obviously be looking at uh the addition of kind of uh standalone soundbar to really bolster that but from our perspective as we go into flagship we really want to make sure that we are offering consumers what we think is a really credible audio performance as well as uh particularly strong audio i think this year um, one of the big uh new uh technologies that our uh, high view engine pro can deliver has been dynamic tone mapping pro um, which has been, I think, a big step forward year on year. I think, you know, as with all things, there's always there's always improvements can be made and excited already to um, uh, be getting some kind of first look at uh, potential uh, developments for 25 and how we're, we're taking that on, uh, you know, further is, uh, is particularly exciting. So I think year on year, the evolution has been really strong. Um, the range itself is slightly smaller in terms of SKUs. So um, last year, the outgoing K series, we had a 55 65 75 this year just two screen options really and that's 75 and 65 so what we've certainly seen and as the market has gone but really that kind of premium space is is being much more aligned to super or the large screen size so our um our uk and, and european lineup uh, reflects that yeah and I, I had the 65 in for review now i want to stress this to listeners because i think you're you're the type of brand who um, certainly if I'd, if I'd given a 7 out of 10 uh, in the past some brands would never speak to me again that's uh -huh. not the highest sense way of doing things is it because you have had 7 out of 10s review wise from me mm -hmm. um, but I think you, you you as a brand you've taken that in the right frame of mind because 7 is not a bad score it's just if you look at X, Y, Z and maybe look to improve those, you're you're going to move further up the rankings, you're going to get better scores. You do listen to, to feedback, not just from myself, but you do listen to feedback out there to try and improve the product. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, although Hisense is a, a kind of a global entity, we've been in the TV market for 50 odd years. Obviously, UK, we've been in the market around about seven. 
Um, and obviously the explosive growth that we've seen in the market across that period, you know, now we uh, are very fortunate to enjoy a position of number three in the UK market on value terms quite comfortably, um, you know, having moved ahead of some real kind of stalwarts of the kind of CE and TV space. So the pace of growth has been enormous. And obviously what's led that growth has been product quality and product innovation. And certainly, as you, as you touch on, I think last year with our U7K, uh, yeah, I mean, we we scored, a, I think, a 7 out of 10 on your review. And obviously, we were keen to take learnings from your review. And I think, you know, we are we are, we are a very kind of lean, agile and, and quite a humble organization that if there are issues, we won't we won't gloss over them. We won't, as you say, kind of throw our toys out the pram. It's something that's the organization is built about how can we improve how can we go mm. forward and that's really what the organization is always about it's, it's always looking forward what what's what's been is you know e even last month is now gone it's in the history books and it's about how we can move forward and how we could improve and that certainly comes across uh in, in our product development as well across all elements as well i mean things you know a nice addition to our kind of u7 plus um uh, models in the range this year is is our new remote. So bringing in solar technology uh, on a full full scale um, remote with obviously shortcut buttons. Really pleased that that remote received a red dot award, which is fantastic for us. And again, it's about kind of trying to bring in innovation into every single kind of step of our kind of product interaction that people have. Obviously, picture quality is key, and, and we obviously understand that as TV manufacturers. But it's something that yeah, we're always looking to try and push the envelope and, and drive innovation for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's encouraging um, and, and refreshing to get that from a brand, I think. Um, uh, and, and certainly you need to be applauded on, on, on the fact that you do listen to not just, you know, reviewers like myself, but you do listen to the whole market. You listen to your consumers and, and you're out to make a, a better product. And that's all we ask as enthusiasts, isn't it, Jules? That, yeah. um, you know, at the end of the day, we just want good product. We're not here yeah. to give manufacturers a kick in. We just, if we think something could be tweaked and, and make it a little bit better, then we Absolutely. should go that way. Absolutely. It's really good to hear that um, that you've been receptive to those, you know, and, and obviously the scores have, scores have gone up. So, it's yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's good for everybody. I'm actually tr intrigued by the solar-powered remote. Is it is it entirely solar? Are there any batteries, you know, any re user-replaceable batteries in there or – is it so, obviously, so it's lithium ion. It's got a USB C charge. So, um, um, but the the uh, design of it means that obviously it charges off of ambient light. So it's not a solar remote that I, you've got to go and put it in the garden on a, <laughs> a sunny day. Um, but then, yeah, through the USB C, a ten minute charge will effectively give you three months. Uh, no, sorry, six months uh, worth of charge. So cool. it's uh, yeah, it's it's the end of uh, that kind of really annoying phase about three times of the year when the remote starts stops yeah. working and you're there banging it out of the way, trying to break it to get the last juice out of the batteries. So yeah. I think from that perspective, it's a really nice move forward. And obviously uh -huh. from a kind of eco credential as well, it's good to be removing that kind of uh, waste out of, out of our kind of environment and system. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Um, and gaming, you know, you know, we, uh, we tend to focus on the movie performance at, at AV forums uh, that that's always been a driver for us, but uh, of course, gaming is a huge uh, area of the market. And it's nice to see that you have added the new Pentonic 700 SOC into, into your process as well, which means that we're now seeing 144 Hertz, 4k and 120 Hertz with Dolby vision HDR as well. Yeah. Yeah, so gaming for us obviously is is a, is a key market um, and certainly a key uh, key focus for us. And certainly in our, um, as you say, one four four hertz products for this year, we have a very strong kind of lineup on up with our one four four hertz game mode pro. We're supporting FreeSync Premium Pro, which is obviously uh, a fantastic proprietary technology. We also support 240 high refresh rate um, if you obviously want to down speed. And as you say, with that Pentonic chip, you know, offering Dolby Gaming is a real kind of move forwards. And then I think for me, or not for me, actually for my kids, I'm, I'm not cool enough to still game. But uh, <laughs> for my kids, you know, the uh, the addition of the game bar that we now see across a number of the ranges is is one of those things that's it's a real nice to have and and has real kind of tangible benefits in that you can while still playing, you don't have to exit the game. You can just dive straight into your um, to your content and and adjust any kind of settings that you want, which is yeah, a real nice to have. Yeah, um, I, I've got to say I was impressed this year um, with the U8. Uh, and the, there is one thing that we need to point 
out, and I did point out in the review that there is a slight difference in terms of the uh, the panels that are used. So uh, the uh, the larger screen, the seventy five inch U uh, eight, has a IPS ADS panel, whereas the sixty five is a VA panel. Do you know why there's a difference there, Rob, or is that just a, a decision that's that's made in development? So I think yeah. So largely, I think that will be a a, a development issue. It's not something that we um, we uh, have a, kind of an influence to say on a on a more local level. So that that will be a kind of a global alignment um, in terms of product sourcing. Um, but obviously, from the various kind of panel suppliers, it's uh, yeah, the, the market changes. So yeah, and two thousand six hundred and I forget the the actual number, but it's two thousand six hundred plus. Nets, and that's in filmmaker mode. So again, you're another manufacturer that has joined the, the UHDA alliance um, and introduced filmmaker mode. It's been on your TVs a couple of years now. So from a, a point of view of of looking towards the the movie viewer and some accurate image quality, you can get it from from your TVs thanks to filmmaker. And uh, you know your your peak net brightness there on a ten percent window is pretty impressive uh, for this level of the market. Yeah, I mean, I think I think brightness certainly as we move forward, and and obviously, you know, there's recently been a lot of noise around um, some ma- new mastering products that are coming through that will enable obviously content provide content producers to be mastering at a much higher brightness level. Uh, although there's obviously some some niche titles, I think it's fair to mm. say that you guys are always using not necessarily great titles, but uh, niche titles. That have <laughs> I think you're referring to Pan, aren't you? I, I, oh. I, I could possibly comment. <laughs> But um, but yeah, so I mean, I think I think you know th- this kind of drive for brightness, uh, you know, is quite a polarized. You know, there are lots of different opinions out there and different views, but I think it's it's one of those kind of realities that um, you know, if you build it, they will come. And and our expectation, I think, along with other brands, is that uh, in in the not too distant future, we'll start to see a lot more kind of um, higher higher brightness mastered content coming through. And in order to achieve the benefits and, and enjoy that then hopefully as you say the sort of specifications that you can see in a premium high sense tv will be able to deliver a, a great experience yeah it, it's impressive to see that at that level of the market and again tone mapping uh, an improvement over last year as well uh, in terms of, of what you're doing with those nets um obviously content up to a thousand nets it doesn't need a, a lot of tone mapping but yeah it, a big improvement there so well done on on that one um let's move down to u7n um so this is uh much more of a, a mass market product and of course your more screen sizes available as well to the end user yeah, so U seven for us is our kind of our, our kind of hero line, and uh, kind of this is the kind of the guts of our um, mini LED range. So here, as you t- uh, touched on, um, a much wider range of products. So screen sizes from 55, 65, 75, 85 up to a uh, hundred inch. Um, so again, kind of coming into this super screen uh, size uh, area, which is a market that we've seen grow exponentially. Um, from a global perspective, obviously we are the the number one global um, hundred inch TV brand, um, which is uh, a great deal of um, I think pride within the organisation ar- around that. And certainly, uh, you know, if we touch on performance recently through the Euros, obviously as title sponsors, we a hell of a lot of activity running not just in the UK but it's certainly on a pan European basis. The performance of hundred inch I think throughout Europe and uh, and beyond has been incredible. So I think as we as we kind of look forwards, here we're talking about our first hundred, but obviously we will now bring in a, a wider range of these kind of super large screens. But yeah, U7 incredibly important for us again. Mini LED Pro technology, so still our flagship uh, backlighting technology. Again, the High View Engine Pro, so it's the real kind of latest in uh, AI processing. Again, evolution year on year quite significant, almost a doubling in performance. So this, if we look at year on year, this is effectively um, getting back to kind of our last year's U8K levels of performance in terms of brightness at kind of 1500 HDR. So a real, real significant step forward. Um, and I would say in, in many instances, it's it's kind of unusual to see that kind of uh, step forward happen within one iteration of a kind of a product launch. But again, as with everything else, full HDR solution, you know, we support Dolby Vision IQ. Again, color tone mapping, dynamic tone mapping pro, IMAX enhanced filmmaker. So there's lots of stuff for the, kind of the, the enthusiast there. Gaming, as we've touched on, is covered off in terms of similar specification for the U8. 
as through the Euros, obviously we've got uh, things like dedicated AI sports mode, which is really kind of great at bringing to life um, that kind of atmospheric um, environment for watching uh, watching sport and TV. So yeah, a really, really strong performance. Uh, again, 2.1 system with a built-in sub, uh, strong audio. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fantastic series. U7K for us this year has been a... a incredibly strong seller uh, and being a huge a huge success for us and and i think this year with the the improvements that we've already seen we have got very very high expectations that the u7 is going to make a big mark on the tv market for this year and, and rob can i just ask about dimming zones um on on these models on the on the u7 how does that compare to the u8 um so obviously uh dimming dimming zones vary by uh by the screen size, but we're probably talking around about the seventy-five percent uh, level. So it's still uh, it's still particularly strong, um, but um, yeah, it's it's yeah. a step-down model. So you, you don't get as many, but it's still reasonably reasonably not, not, good. Not quite, but uh, yes, um, but yeah, the performance on it obviously at fifteen hundred uh, kind of nits peak brightness versus the three thousand. So there's obviously uh, you know a, a, a difference in performance there, but uh -huh. it still supports our mini LED Pro backlighting uh, configuration, which is our flagship kind of uh, technology. Off the top of my head, this will show you. Um, I think it's three hundred and eighty-four dimming zones on the U seven N. Um, off the top of my head, and for the sixty-five for the sixty-five yeah. inch, there's the one I reviewed. Yes, yeah. so three eight four uh -huh. is a number that I, I seem to have. It lodged in my head, and I believe it's about 1100 nits in filmmaker mode off the top of uh -huh. my head as well. So, uh -huh. so yeah, a, a really good performance uh, specifications there. And you know, I really like the fact that you, I, you're agnostic in terms of HDR as well. So, all the formats HDR yeah. 10, HDR 10 plus, HDR 10 plus adaptive. Um, I'm pretty sure in the video I had to redo that bit but four or five times because I kept forgetting one of them because there was so many <laughs> different uh, IMAX enhanced in there as well. So, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, screen sizes, um, you've been, you've kind of held back with the UAN, um, only having the two yet, you've, you've really gone to town with uh, U7 all the way up to 100 inches. So, again, what's the what's the thinking behind that and, and why is you know, you ain't not getting the, the super size screens here. So um, I think certainly given the success we've had this year for the U7K, we know that it's a platform that can really um, kind of drive that mix between premium and, and volume, which is obviously essential for us. So I think certainly uh, U7 with the full array uh, of screen sizes this year will continue to be our kind of uh, mini LED super large focus. But the U8N is is perhaps for more of a slightly kind of a discerning consumer. Um, yeah, 65, 75, when we look at the market size, we you know, we think that's really kind of the sweet spots for that kind of specific lineup for this year. Yeah. One question I do want to ask, um, and it's something that we've seen from a few manufacturers uh, over the last couple of years, is that the smart TV systems. So Vida, it has advertising being served um, on the smart TV system. And I know we've had a lot of negative comments from our users in terms of not high sense, in, but manufacturers in general, um, seven advertising um, on the smart TV system. So from, from high sense's point of view, um, is there a reason why you do that? And, and what is the reason behind the, the adverts being served on, on smart TV? So, so uh, as you say, advertising on uh, smart platforms is something that I think is has been been around for a while, um, and is is certainly not unique to kind of the Vida platform as such. Mm. Uh, um, and I think it's it's something that is is developing and is obviously continually continuously evolving and changing. Um, so, I think our approach is that we. Um, Obviously, through Vida, uh, as I say, although we uh, we have a direct relationship with Vida, Vida are, are are a kind of their individual entity, so they have their own kind of uh, their own ambitions. We obviously work with them in order to try and facilitate a uh, a harmonious um, kind of uh, relationship with them, and making sure that we can kind of give consumers the the very best in 
service and proposition. So it's something that I think we we are continually reviewing, and and certainly um, when issues or, or challenges are being made to the platform in respect of that, it's something that we will be taking on board and, uh, and reviewing our future approach. Excellent. Um, Hisense is a company. Uh, let's step back a little bit from, from TV. Um, people might or might not be aware that it's not just TVs that, that you sell in the UK. You're very well uh, versed in, in white goods, everything from fridge freezers and so on. So as a company, you've been in the UK uh, a few years now. How are things in terms of where you want it to be? And, and how do you see things moving uh, forward in terms of your ethos and your, your strategy with the UK market? And, and where do you want to be in the next five years? So, uh, so yeah, as, as, as you quite rightly say, obviously, it's not just all about TV, although obviously from my perspective it is. But uh, certainly, at my, you know, my MBA colleagues have, had, uh, have enjoyed a significant amount of success um and and the growth within our white goods business within the uk has been incredible uh and again i believe in uh, certain segments we've got very very strong uh, kind of market leading share positions i think you know where do we where do we want to be well the the, the only way is up the only way is forward so uh, you know i think we have strong ambitions to to grow uh, as an organization uh into a uh, you know a, a a brand that people love and engage with and respect uh, you know, we hopefully through uh, through your dealings with us, you know, our, our brand our brand kind of uh, meaning for us here is really one built around trust, honesty, integrity, and kind of doing the right thing. So that's something that we certainly want to build on in terms of that kind of the brand message as we move forward. Um, obviously, with uh, activity such as the Euros and other kind of global sponsorship deals, it's really about kind of driving that brand awareness. But from a product perspective as well, it's it's about making sure that consumers are just loving their product, and I think that's one of the things that I you know really enjoy seeing is that, that as much in some instances, the field that you've kind of touched on in terms of kind of expert reviews with you know AV forms and yourself. Sometimes you know historically we've had we've had challenges or not challenges, but you know scores of seven out of ten that, as you say, would be perceived as being uh, major issues and kind of reasons for uh, relationship issues, should we say, as we move for, for other brands. We're not like that, but what we do like to see is our consumer reviews, and 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 it's amazing when we look at our overall our consumer reviews about how much our consumers are enjoying our products, even down to some of our kind of more entry entry propositions. So it's really about kind of growing everywhere, delighting people, and continuing to uh, hopefully bring innovation and excitement to uh, to some really strong categories of both across consumer electronics, but also across um, domestic appliance as well. And. Just to wrap up on on the TV side of things, I've got two final questions. Maybe Jules wants to jump in with some that he maybe has. But for me, the 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 one thing that has been in your portfolio but seems to be missing at the moment is is an OLED option. So is OLED still viable technology for iSense? Is it still something that that you're looking to develop, or are you more uh, focused with Mini LED at this time? So, so yeah, so uh, um, as we say, we will be launching uh, again, it's in Q4, it's coming a little bit later than we perhaps would have liked. So we will bring you bring into the market uh, our A85N series of OLED, so 55 and 65 inch, so just the two screen size um, that will come later in the year. Um, so again, you know, we, we, we want to be technology agnostic, whether or not it's super large screen, laser, TV, whether or not it comes into TV, it's mini LED, it's OLED, it's QLED, it's... 4K UHD. Our, our proposition is we have something for, for everybody. For you know, and anybody can find what they need within uh, the high sense assortment. And to that end, we are we are kind of technology agnostic. We don't mind what what you buy. Our our view is that obviously mini LED we believe can uh, give a stronger level of performance. And certainly as we move forward, we believe that the future of mini LED is is bright. Without that being too much of a pun. Um, so that's obviously where our, our focus is. But yeah, OLED, we uh, we will have a proposition launching, as I say, Q4 this year. And, and Rob, um, being being agnostic, have you chosen QD OLED or um, have you chosen um, MLA or you know what what kind of panels are going into those OLEDs? Do you know? Um, so I can tell you, it's not QD OLED. Uh -huh. That's for sure. Right. Um, so yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's not a QD OLED panel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and OLEDs are getting. Really pretty bright now. When I measured an S95D Samsung at 2,000 nits, I mean that's mm. that's pretty impressive. Mm. 
Um, so, um, but as you say, um, what, what we know from the from grading studios uh, driven by Sony may, basically is that there's their head they're pushing towards four thousand. It's I think it's going to take some time. Yeah. For that to catch up in the in the in the professional post production market, but um, that's where there's certainly a degree of uh, of push um, mm. from certain manufacturers. Mm. Yeah, and I think, yeah. and yes, I mean, definitely, obviously, as you say, with things like MLA and QD OLED and uh -huh. and other other innovations, then obviously across all TVs, frankly, obviously the the level of performance year on year is is obviously always being driven and and kind of driven quite hard, but. I think it's it's interesting as well when you you know you look at other brands and what their approach has been to kind of OLED mini LED. You know, I think you know we're in a position now where these are, and will be, I think probably the next you know four or five years for sure. The kind of the two the two kind of the premium technologies, and it's a case of one or the other. So um, yeah, for us, I think it's it's about how we can really kind of push forward and drive both elements. But our, but our view obviously on mini LED is where we believe uh, that kind of the future lies. And giant TVs. Um, obviously, you guys are now bringing in these these super large TVs. So, from a, a UK perspective, um, because obviously that that's your market, Rob. Um, what is the data that that you're working to here? And it, is there this push for these ultra large giant TVs? And uh, you know, are they selling? Are they selling volume? Yeah. So, I mean, we're certainly seeing significant growth. I mean. Uh, in, in terms of year on year, as it currently stands uh, within our current range that you can uh, you can go out and buy now, at all major retailers, uh, we only have one one model, which will be our 100U7K, which has been performing incredibly well for us. It's obviously a, a premium specified model. There are other more, much more entry type propositions out in the market within that space. But ours obviously occupies a kind of a a a higher kind of higher end of the market but certainly sell out on on that platform this year has been particularly strong i think what we're most excited about as we move forward into our 2024 range um will be obviously 110 coming later the 100 u7n coming uh coming in this year to obviously replace the u7k with the 3d platform across everything will be exciting but then sitting below those we will bring in a uh, 100 e7n pro um, so a kind of QLED Pro 144 Hertz product, which is, I think, going to be a kind of a real sweet spot for that kind of 100 inch type market. And also an E7N, uh, 100 E7N, so a slightly kind of lower spec uh, kind of QLED proposition. Uh, so still, again, you know, versus the market, a uh, uh, an improvement in kind of some products that are out there. But um, I think the view for 100 inch moving forward will be yeah significant growth. And certainly we've started to see that within some of our other European markets where uh, they've had access to that product slightly ahead of us here in the UK, uh, particularly in time for the Euros, where uh, we know, you know, some of the some of the markets have been enjoying kind of sell out in excess of more than a thousand units a week, which is not bad going for uh, 100 inch TVs. Yeah, it is. And, you know, when it comes to that kind of screen size, you're talking about logistics as well in terms of delivery and so on. So as a brand, did, is, is that a, a, a factor when it comes to introducing these models and then through the dealerships that, that you're then selling those? Is, is that a factor? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if... Uh... You know, if if we one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have is is around the logistics and physicality of these products. Um, that said, you know we work very closely with our retail partners, and uh, and you know they've been incredibly accommodating, uh, not only to us obviously, but to the market. They've they've seen it, and they they're the guys who are kind of I suppose in a way proactively driving driving this trend. Without those guys' support, this wouldn't happen. So. Um, but the logistics, as we move forward, certainly is is throwing up some challenges that perhaps uh, perhaps certainly didn't exist, um, uh, yeah, in, in recent years. And has it had any impact on on laser TV, or do you you find that those two markets are slightly different in terms of what the, the consumers are looking for? Yeah, as I say, I mean, this year we've we've had uh, we've had stellar growth again on on our, uh, our, our laser TV business. Um, so, uh, on, and what is what is effectively a pretty kind of stabilised and uh, kind of legacy business. So, uh, we've certainly seen growth there. And as I say, I think I think the kind of the, the consumer split between uh, TV and that kind of projection type consumer is still is still significantly different enough that there's there's mm. uh, certainly a market for both. Yeah. Jules, any final questions for Rob? 
Um, I'm not sure right now. We've covered a lot of territory um, in 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 this, and there's there's plenty of different options there in the high sense range for everybody, isn't there? I mean, there is the uh, there there is huge TVs, as small TVs, as LED. You've got you've got something in there for everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing also my my question as a calibrator is, um, I, I believe there's a high sense. Um, auto cal available is that yes. linked in with calman do you know and um yes. does it yeah yeah I, I noticed in your review though phil it wasn't enabled while it, when you, when you one of the reviews not yet not yet but it is there yeah. um and and again that's that's refreshing to see Rob. yeah um but and and obviously i think it's pentonic that's opened that that channel up for you uh -huh. hasn't it the, to be yeah. able to add the calman support yeah, and I think I think as you say, these these are things that as we kind of evolve as as we're evolving and and kind of looking to try and push things forward. Whenever there are opportunities for us to, you know, potentially stray into areas where in the past, you know, if we went back two three years, perhaps you know, Calman type calibrate and on a high sense product, you would perhaps be thinking, is there a requirement? But certainly, as we're kind of moving forward and, and the evolution, we're making sure that, you know, wherever we can, we can make sure that our proposition is kind of fully aligned to what the end user uh, ultimately will, will will require. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really, really healthy and positive. Um, you know, AV Forums uh, users, not everybody, but but many of them will want their TVs to be as accurate as possible. Um, obviously, Filmmaker Mode delivers a certain level of accuracy out the box, but um, we can always do better. And... <laughs> um, uh, and to be able to deliver that 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 final that final few uh, uh, percentage of import of of uh, of sorry of performance um, color wise uh, is going to be very important to some people. So it's good to see. Yeah, I, th I think if it, if there was any um, feedback from our side, Rob, uh, to High Sense is is keep it up. Um, uh -huh. You know, I think uh, I think you guys are on on to uh, you know a winner there and. You know, a few tweaks, and I, I say this every year in my reviews. You know, a few tweaks here and there, add add in some uh, this technology. And I think UI, um, the UI is excellent. I think adding in AI um, has certainly helped you guys push on, and, and the likes of the Pentonic chip being added in there and giving you the the features. So yeah, any from our, our side, it's keep keep up the good work. You're yeah, you're proving year on year that the products are are, are definitely improving. Excellent. Well, th yeah, thank you very much for that, Phil. Thank you. And well, thanks, Julian. that wraps up our uh, TV display and calibration edition of the AV Forms podcast for this week. Rob, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for your time. And um, we'll see you very, again soon, hopefully. Perfect. Um, yeah, but... thanks very much, Phil and, uh, and Julian. And yeah, yeah look forward to seeing you. Uh, well, if not Aoife, maybe at CES again. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll, we might bump into each other at CES again. Um, and don't forget, if you're out there watching and listening, our next episode of the AV Forms podcast is the Home AV edition. And that's on Monday, the 19th of August. And again, all our podcasts are available from 7pm on the AV Forms podcast YouTube channel. Uh, so go and subscribe to that channel if you want those podcasts uh, straight away. And also audio only versions are available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and other providers. And of course, that's every Monday. You get a podcast every Monday, you lucky, lucky people. Um, before we wrap up, though, we do have competitions and we also have patrons uh, and new patrons and so on. So, Jules, yep. uh, do you want to do the, the honours there and tell us all about the competitions? Yeah, there's some great, uh, great competitions this time. That you can win a single Oslo home cinema seat worth £1,400, courtesy of Valencia Theatre Seating. And this features Italian top grain Nabhut leather, a powered headrest and lumbar adjustments, hidden arm storage and LED lighting. The closing date on this and all the competitions, in fact, is 11.59 p.m. Friday, 31st of August, 2024. You can also win £500 to spend with MPB. MPB is the largest global platform to buy and sell and trade in used photo and video gear. And you can win a streaming system worth £2,400, which includes a Rock Center Tessa integrated streaming amp, and the monitor audio silver 107 g bookshelf speakers excellent and uh, do we have any previous competition winners we do we have stevio 67 who won a denon avr x 1800h 
AVR worth 699, courtesy of Peter Tyson. You, uh, we have BHX TC who won a pair of QAQ 6M40 powered micro tower speakers and QED digital cables worth 1,069 pounds. And we have Badger Stuter who won a copy of Chinatown on 50th anniversary collector's edition 4K UHD worth 40 pounds. Excellent. And don't forget, uh, competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members over 18, a resident of the UK. So basically anybody but me, you can enter. Uh, head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions to enter. And it's not just hardware, you can also win DVDs, Blu-rays, 4K discs and so on. And there are also special competitions open to our patrons. Thank you very much for your support, patrons. And we've got some new patrons, uh, Joe. Absolutely. We've got Les Hewitt, Bruce Wood and Mark Thatcher. Excellent. And uh, buying us a coffee was... Yes, tea. <laughs> tea bought us three coffees. Three coffees. Well, we, we'll enjoy those right now. Um, but yes, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your time. Uh, don't forget, the next edition's coming very soon is the Home AV edition. And I'm Phil Henson. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>